Hello, cheapskaters. It is 7.30, two minutes slip by so fast. I'm Kath Armstrong, creator of the Cheapskates Club, where our goal is to live life debt-free, cashed up and laughing. If this is your first time visiting us, welcome. And if it's not, welcome back. Hi. It is Tuesday, the 18th of April, 2023, and this is a live show. So whatever happens, eh, it happens. Live chat is on and Delaney is our moderator. So please be kind and make her job easy. To join the live chat, you do need to be logged into your YouTube channel or Gmail account. And that's a YouTube requirement, not mine. If you don't have one, not a problem. You can leave a comment in the comment section below. Now, just while we give everyone time to get here, I'm just going to pop over and see who's already here and say hello. Where am I? Oh my, we've got 56 people watching. Woohoo! Thank you everyone for watching on time. Hello Estelle and Amanda, Barb. Glad you're watching from home, Barb. And Beverly, Delaney. Um, let's see, who else? I'm floating through these comments, guys. It's Hello, Paula. I haven't forgotten that I owe you an email, but I've had a bit of a week, so um, I haven't forgotten you, though. Hello, Yvonne. Hello, Julie. Hello, Pat. Early in Ohio. Well, we're glad you could join us. It was probably me this morning, about 3 a.m. I was up. Could not sleep. Um... Uh, hello, Lisa and Jenny, Wild Woman, Aradia, um, Greg Evans, hello, Mary, Mrs. Dillagaff, oh my goodness, Sheena. Um, did you see my comment, Sheena, about the TVP? I think you did. I was checking. And Tegan, hello, Veronica and Melissa, goodness, Catnaps, Catherine. Woo, we've got lots of people. Hello, Leone. Hello, Beverly and L Lona, all the way from Georgia. Welcome. We are really pleased to have you. We love meeting new people and we love to know where our new friends come from. Hello, Selena and Simply Good Life and hello, Kelly and Karen and Krista and hello, Wendy. <laughs> Goodness me, we've got a lot of people now. There's 70 people watching. Okay, so let me see. Um, and hello, oh, hello, Joy. Ron's too tired to go dancing. Oh, I'm a bit tired myself. And Pam, hello. Goodness, people keep popping in. This is really good. Okay. I think I'm pretty frugal. I um, try to be frugal. I try to live frugally. But let me tell you, the last three years, not only with the lockdowns and things messed with my sense of time, it's really messed, really, really messed with our, our income, our budgeting, our finances, and I'm pretty sure we're not alone. Now, that doesn't mean that it's all gone to pot and we're in debt up to our eyeballs and, you know, or anything like that. It just means that we've had to rejig things quite a lot. So, hello, Maureen and Cheryl and Lynette and Ms. Aussie Thunder. Woohoo! Okay, so we've had to rejig things a lot. And that just means <laughs> that, you know, I've been, um, I've been on the calculator and on my little, on my, my diary and I've had my books out and I've had all sorts of things out, going through things. Anyway, this last week especially has been a tad trying. Um, so much has happened um, within our family unit this week. I wasn't sure, I actually wasn't sure whether I'd be able to do this live um, or pre-recording it and setting it as a premiere for you. I wasn't sure. And even today, today was just frantic. 
But right now, there is nothing else I can do to fix any other problems. So here I am. Here I am with you. Now, even with the craziness of the last three years, we are debt free. It wasn't easy, but we are debt free. We have savings. Again, it wasn't easy, but we have savings. We have an emergency fund that definitely wasn't easy to build, but we have it. And yeah, we're, we're still laughing. We're still debt free, cashed up and laughing if you look at it that way. What we aren't is high income earners and we never have been. We're also not extravagant. And we try really, really hard not to be wasteful. Now, once disaster was over, we lived on a, a very modest income for years. And while the children were younger and at school, it was tough. I have to say, as each of them left school, we felt so rich. And now they're grown up and support themselves, we feel even richer. <laughs> income hasn't changed, but the expenses have. We still live a frugal life and we're trying to live a more frugal life, not because we're mean skin flints, but because inflation's hitting, prices are going up on everything. And for months, I've had this feeling, this urge to keep on pantry building, to keep on preparing. And in the last two or three weeks, that that urge has been an absolute feeling in my in my tummy and it's intensified to the point where i've made lists i've made plans i've redone the inventories and i've started to put everything together so that we've got something to work with moving forward i learned a long time ago not to ignore that little voice that tells me to do something it niggles at me for a reason. It's a bit like mum in my ear telling me to clean my room, clean my room, clean my room. Well, this is like, get your house in order, get your house in order. Inflation's hitting hard and it, and it can't be denied. And I know that we're being told that it's eased somewhat. You know, things are, are levelling out. I don't think so, folks. And that urge to keep stockpiling and pantry building, I think it's more relevant than ever before. Now, pantry building and stockpiling isn't new to me. I have been doing it for hmm, 29 years, almost 29 years, and I've been encouraging others to do it almost as long. You know, it started with um, the mums at Playgroup um, when the children were small. Hannah wasn't even born and I had um, AJ and Thomas and we'd go to play group and we had a mortgage back then and you know interest rates the mortgage might have been smaller by interest rates you know they were a lot more they were 18 eight and a half percent so and our income was considerably smaller and then of course disaster struck and that's when people started to notice that we didn't actually have an income. Wayne wasn't working or he didn't have regular work. I was pregnant, so I wasn't going to get work. But our life didn't change. Our lifestyle didn't change. And they wanted to know why. And I started to explain to them, the mums at playgroup, the young mums at church, friends, neighbours, whoever would listen, how we were doing it. And it started with my pantry and it started with filling that pantry so that I never paid full price for groceries and so that I could be sure we would never go hungry. My babies would not go hungry. I encouraged everyone I came in touch with, everyone, even my own mother, and she is pretty good at having a pantry stockpile. I would encourage them to build that pantry and to have a stockpile. We didn't call it a stockpile in those days. It was just a backup. We had a backup in the pantry. Hasn't changed. I still do that. And I do it because I like the way we live. 
I like knowing that um, when a bill comes in, the money is already in the budget to pay it. And we've done that because I've been smart with our food bill. Because our food bill is the one bill that I have absolute total control over. I choose how much we spend. I choose what it gets spent on, when it gets spent. It's entirely in my control, within my control. I like being able to, um, to go away for the weekend or to go on, on longer trips. We have a longer trip coming up in June and July. It's paid for. I like being able to grow our food. I like being able to craft. I like to be to be generous. And I don't want to change my lifestyle. So preparing and being prepared, be it our pantry or our garden or our finances, it just makes sense. And to do that, we need to be frugal. We survived 2007, 2008 without a hiccup. We didn't change the way we lived. We ate what we always ate. We still went on a holiday. Um, we still celebrated special occasions. And actually, in that time, we bought a new car. And we were able to do that because we were prepared. Back in 2005... had the feeling that our pantry wasn't enough and we've talked about how much is enough in other shows but back then I just didn't think the pantry was enough and I really started working hard to build it up it wasn't easy it absolutely wasn't easy because we had three kids in private school we had bills to pay um, our income was limited but every shopping day, and back then I was doing once a month shopping, every shopping day something was added to the pantry stockpile. It was boosted by a little bit. Now, I consider my pantry, my stockpile, an investment. I've had discussions with people about this in the past who don't think that it's important. They think it's foolish to tie money up in groceries. Well, if I can, you know, save 50% on my food bill, that's a better return on my, my investment, my grocery shopping investment, than anything anyone is getting on any stocks or any bonds, any interest that they are receiving from anything. It's a better return on investment. My pantry is a good investment. The return on it is enormous. Our grocery bill is set, but the value of the pantry is way more than double the grocery bill. It's worth a lot more. So I consider it um, an investment. And I'm I'm not a fan of investing, investing per se, as in, you know, putting things in the stock market or whatever. So I, th I think that's a gamble and we don't gamble. But, and that's us, you do what you like. Um, but there's no gamble, there's no risk when I put, when I invest in my pantry. There is no risk. Anyway. I also started to seriously grow food. Now, as long as we've been married, I've had some sort of little garden going, you know, a few tubs of tomatoes. We had an, um, a passion fruit vine that I wish we still had because I love passion fruit. But anyway, just little things like that, some herbs. But back then, that's when I started to seriously grow food. And that's when we redid the backyard and put in the first lot of raised beds. Um, for veggie beds I scrimped and scraped so that we could get the get those beds and and put them in and I started to really seriously preserve as in preserve 
the excess of what we grew. Um, I didn't just think, oh, yeah, there's a few tomatoes left, I'll toss them in the freezer or there's, you know. I actually consciously made sauce. I um, did the peas. I grated the zucchini. I did all those things, chopped the capsicum, chopped the onions, portioned them out, bagged them up and put them in the freezer. I started to seriously um, preserve so that, again, the value of our pantry increased. I did it because I had a feeling, I had a feeling that I needed to be prepared. Now, we were already debt free, which was a relief. So we concentrated on making sure that our emergency fund was um, enough. And we built our savings. Now, emergency fund and savings, two different things. Our savings to us, our savings are for things like we save up to go on holidays or we save up for new furniture if we decide we want new furniture or we're saving up for um, it's gone. But we save up for, for things that aren't in our budget. Our emergency fund is savings that is separate to everything and it is strictly for us to live on in an emergency because we have had a financial emergency when we had no income or no, no regular um, reliable income for over three years. It was hard. I don't want to do that again. So we have an emergency fund and we built that emergency fund up so that we can live for an extended period of time on that money. We don't touch it. We do touch our savings because it's meant to be spent. Now, if you come forward from 2008, come forward, what is it, 15 years to 2023, that, that niggles back, that little voice, the urge, it's back. And it's, it's greater, greater than ever. And I'm not going to ignore it. I'm not. I've learned the hard way. So my advice is if you have that same feeling, get working. Don't ignore it. Build your pantry. Pay down your debt. Because those are the two things that will cause you the most grief if you are not prepared financially. Eating. You know, it's important to have a pantry because eating is not only something that we actually enjoy, it is vital to life. And debt, well, you know, I say when you owe money, and that's any money, no matter how much, you own nothing and you can lose it all. And in this day and age when the financial world is so precarious, it's more important than ever to get rid of those debts. So get it paid down. Work hard on paying that down. You know, interest rates on loans, not just mortgages, but any loan, they're going up faster than ever before. So throw every spare cent you can at your debt and get rid of it. If that means that you eat the plainest of food for 12 months, so be it. It's only for 12 months till you get that debt gone. Once the debt's gone, you've got that um, money that you're putting off the debt, you can put into buying tastier food. But once you've got rid of your debt, stay debt free. No more debting. Learn to save up for what you need or what you want to buy or learn to trade or learn to moo it. Don't borrow money. Don't put it on the credit card. Don't take a loan. Be patient. Save up for it so that you own it. It is so, so important to know that you own what you have and that you can stay debt free. Now, let me just pop back. 100 people watching. I'd really like a hundred thumbs up would just make hundred thumbs up would be amazing. But Krista's debt free. Yes. Um, 
Oh, Andrea, um, off topic for a minute. When you can your mints, is it just the mints? Yes, just the mints. When you are pressure canning mints, it is just the meat and water or stock. I put water in mine because I want just the meat. Um, don't put te do not put TVP in it. TVP is not approved for for canning. Um, Joy says she's been listening to her niggle too. Well done, Joy. Because I don't know, is it your um, butterflies in your tummy? Is it a niggle? Is it a little voice? Whatever it is, listen to it and work um, work with it. Don't ignore it. Um, okay. Amanda's just got the USDA home canning guide. The ball blue book is really good and you can often pick those up. Often pick those up. Secondhand book sales, op shops. You'll find ball, ball book of preserving or the ball blue book of preserving. Um, absolutely. I, I refer back to it all the time. Um, okay, Krista. Good point. Okay. Says her neighbour had pantry moths throughout her pantry and had to throw out a lot of things and it took her a week to clean and sort it out. Right. This is going to sound gross, but for things like your flowers, cornflour, custard powder, that sort of thing, sift it. Don't throw it out, just sift it and get rid of the weevils, get rid of the um, moths sift it make sure your containers are washed and dried thoroughly so they are properly dry before you put your food back into it you can freeze it um but don't throw it out don't throw it out i know that sounds gross um eating weevils won't kill you it just won't um, it sounds gross and we've been um, brainwashed into thinking that we can't eat them and I, and I am not a let's all eat bugs type person because seriously, I don't think I could face a bug, you know, lizards or uh, what are they, grasshoppers, locusts, whatever, no. Although we grew up with cochineal and what is cochineal? It's a bug. Um, we didn't know it. Um, so, all right, all right. Catherine says she considers a pantry's insurance. Yes, it is. Um, all right. And. Woohoo, Pat, that's really good. Just replaced our furnace yesterday. We waited until our winter was over and got a great deal, but the thing that was best was that they could pay for it without touching their savings. Yes, I love story. I love hearing things like that. I hope it gives you many years of wonderful winter warmth. Okay, where are we? All right. Hi, Annabelle. All right. Let me go back. I've lost my spot. Oh, oh, oh. All right. Now, we're talking about um, listening to our voice. So prices are going up. Um, the increase in power, if anyone could tell me why the power price is going up and why it's going up to 30%, because who decided that was the figure it had to go up? I'd really like to know. Fuel, those two things. Um, not so much the groceries, but those two things, power and fuel or gas, power, gas and fuel, they've really impacted our budget. So it came down to whether um, we'd either go without or we'd become even more frugal. I don't like going without. I'm human. I'm, a, I'm, I'm human. I like pretty things. I like nice things. I like to be comfortable. I like to be cool in summer, warm in winter. I don't want to go without. 
I'm I'm spoiled. I'll tell you, I'm spoiled. So we decided we'd become more frugal. I like what I like. And I'm prepared to make changes so that I can keep um, having those things. And I'm pretty sure that most of you would be in the same boat um, and you're probably thinking the same way. You don't want to have to go without. You don't want to have to give up the things that you like, let alone the things that you actually need or that your family needs. So you're going to live a more frugal life. But if you're already frugal, how can you um, live a more frugal life? You're probably thinking that you can't possibly, can't possibly be more frugal. But you can, if you really want to be that way, you can. Now, we'll start with me because, you know, vanity, thy name is Kath. Sorry, guys. You probably noticed my hair. Now, it needs a trim. But I need my visiting hairdresser to be here to trim it for me because I won't pay to get my hair cut. Now, I'm really sorry if you are a hairdresser trying to make a living, but salon cuts are not in our budget. They just aren't. And my hair also needs a colour touch up. All because I was bored in lockdown. That, my friends, is just not going to happen because I've used up all the 99 cent colors that I bought on clearance back in 2020. Right now, I'm not prepared to pay $24 every six weeks to color my hair. And I can live with going gray. <laughs> doesn't bother me because the only time I see my hair is when I brush it in the morning. So, you know, it doesn't really worry me. Now, I did a quick think about it and I realized that not doing that is keeping $200 or around $200 a year in our budget. Now, you could take that and extend it to haircuts. That was just the colours, extend it to haircuts. And I did a quick Google search and I found that it costs eh, around $39 for a cut. And that's just a cut. There's no washing, no dry off, just the cut. If you learn to cut your own hair, you can keep around $312 a year in your pocket or your budget. Now, I know a lot of cheapskaters who have perfected the Moo haircut and their hair always looks great. And men's and children's haircuts are just as expensive. So do what we did when our kids were little. We invested in a pair of clippers and I learned how to cut their hair. It's not hard. It's not hard. If I could learn to do it, you can too. And these days, you've got YouTube. YouTube makes it so easy. And there are dozens of videos to watch that show you step by step how to do the different men's haircuts. And you know what? No colouring, no haircuts. And straight away, I'm keeping around $500 in our bank account simply by not doing home hair colours and if I cut Wayne's hair myself. It didn't take much effort at all to do those two things. Wayne's hair is really easy because I've learned number two and just go and I'm lucky with his hair. He has lots of it, doesn't matter. But what I really want to stress, making small changes to the way you spend your money so that you're living a more frugal version of the cheapskates way doesn't take a lot of effort and it isn't painful. That had me thinking about what other changes can you make that will keep more of your money in your purse without really hurting, without you feeling deprived. We've covered hair, so while we're on appearances, let's talk about clothes. Now, I will admit, I have a lot of clothes. I mean, I have a whole wardrobe full of them, with along with drawers and shelves, and I've got some in storage that should have been um, swapped out by now for the change of seasons, but I haven't got there yet. I have plenty of clothes. And you probably do too. 
So how often have you opened the wardrobe doors and you stood there looking and gone, got nothing to wear? Or you've had an event to go to, a meeting or a wedding or a party or something, and you open the wardrobe door and you stand there and go, I've got nothing to wear. Well, chances are, you know, they're pretty, pretty high that you actually have plenty to wear. You're just not seeing it. Clothes are expensive. Even cheap clothes have gone up in price and the quality seems to have gone down even lower. So they're cheaper cheap clothes at a higher price. So it just makes sense to wear what you have. And if you look after what you have so it stays um, in good condition, it's wearable longer. Now, in researching this, um, I came across um, a couple of fun things to do. And one of them we've talked about before, and that's just empty your wardrobe and use what you have to create new outfits. So find new ways to wear what you have. You can use a shirt as a jacket over a dress or a jumper. Um, roll up the hems on trousers to shorten them for casual wear in summer. Unroll them for more formal wear or when it's cooler. Think about layers. And especially as we're coming into winter, look at what you have and think about how, how you can wear it. Um, if you add a scarf to it, will it change it? Or layer a t-shirt with a cardigan or a jacket. Wear tights under a skirt. Change the belt on a dress. Think outside the box or, or the wardrobe. Um, and come up with new ways to wear things. If you've got a, a summer dress, a sleeveless summer dress, it can be worn in winter with a long sleeve blouse or t-shirt underneath it. And a cardigan or jacket over the top. If you have something that you really like, but the colour's wrong, dye it. Go and get some Rit dye and dye it. If something is still in really good condition, but you don't like the colour anymore, just dye it. Now, I dyed my favourite T-shirt a month or so ago, I think I'm sure I told you, and gave it a new life. I have worn that T-shirt at least three times a week since then because I just love it. It looks so fresh and new. And did you know that you can dye shoes? Canvas runners can be dyed. If they're looking a little shabby, give them a wash, dry them, then dye them. Just, just follow the instructions on the bottle. If, and if I can do it, anyone can do it. It is easy. The other thing you can do with, with your, all your clothes on the bed is when you put it together, an outfit, take a photo of it. So you can recreate it later on. You don't have to rely on your um, memory. And if you do this, you could find that you don't need any new clothes at all this year. And how much will that save you? How much money will that keep in your, in your budget? Look, even if you buy your clothes gently used, by not buying anything, you'll be keeping... $50, $100, I don't know how much you budget for, for new clothes um, or how much you spend, but you'll be keeping that much in your bank account. And I found some really fun tools that you can use too um, that help you dress better using what you have without spending money. Do some research on capsule wardrobes. Mind-blowing. It just means you've got a very small um, wardrobe or group of clothes that can be put together in many, many, many different ways for so many different occasions. You have a few choice garments that they all mix and match perfectly so you'll always have the right outfit for the occasion. Sounds great. This one I loved, Project 333. And it means that you have a, a capsule wardrobe of 33 items that you wear for three months. So 
that's a season. Now, those 33 items, that means all your clothes, your jewellery, your shoes, the accessories, coats, um, jumpers, shirts, skirts, trousers, dresses. Choose 33 articles of clothing or jewellery, shoes, accessories, and wear them for three months. Change them up. Swap them around. Mix and match. Now, it doesn't include your underwear, your PJs, your workout wear, just your day wear or night evening wear, formal wear, whatever. But how much fun would that be for a challenge? And I think for someone like me, I think it would be a great learning curve because I get stuck. I think this goes with this and that's all, and I wear, you know, A with B. That's all I do with it. I don't often branch out. If you did something like that, you, you'd get to know what goes with what and which things you really like and, and which things that you really like wearing and the things that you actually don't like wearing. And I'm sure we've all got a few of those too. And it's another fun way of not spending money on clothes so that you can become more frugal. Now, I just want to pop in here and say that just being frugal to build a huge bank account that's probably not the right reason to be frugal and if that's your attitude that often leads to huge budget blowouts but if you are being frugal with a goal you're being frugal to pay down your debt to build an emergency fund to save up for a holiday or a new car or to enjoy something really important to you. Well, when you're living the frugal lifestyle and being more frugal for a reason, you, you have the focus and the motivation to keep going to reach your goals. So another way, you know, you can do that is to set goals. And one of those goals would be to stop eating out so much. Now, I said so much. I didn't say all together. We don't eat out very often. In fact, we rarely eat out. And I know a lot of cheapskaters don't eat out at all or, you know, only for very special occasions. We choose to save going to a restaurant for a really special occasion so that it's a real treat. It's something we look forward to something we plan for because if you know it's like everything if you do it all the time it it loses the treat factor and it just becomes an expensive <laughs> ho-hum habit it, it's you know there's nothing special about it so perhaps if you're in the habit of catching up with friends at a cafe a couple of times a week change where you meet or if you're in the habit of going out for dinner every Saturday night just because it's Saturday night choose to stay home every second Saturday or cut back to going out to eat once a month. I'm not, I'm not saying don't eat out at all. You know, if you're in the, if that's what you like to do, then just become choosy about the when, the where, the why, the occasion, make it special. When when you only eat out occasionally and it's for a really special occasion, a really important reason, it's, it's not just a treat, but you actually enjoy it more because it's so special and you're not jaded by the choice. It isn't a ho-hum everyday thing. I have to get dressed to go out again. It is a treat. You know, and if you're spending $50 every time you eat out and you're in the habit of eating out three times um, three times a week and I was a bit gobsmacked by this but I've been assured that that's a modest number of times that Australians actually eat out. If you cut back to once a week, you're keeping $2,600 in your purse. If you cut that back to eating out just once a month, you're keeping $7,200 in your purse. That's two mortgage repayments on an average mortgage. 
and I've got people telling me they can't afford to pay the mortgage. So, hello? Think about it. Think about how you spend your money. You know, if you're worrying about how you're going to pay the mortgage, but you're still eating out, and you really want to be a bit more frugal, then perhaps cut back on the eating out. And that sort of brings me to another way to become more frugal, and that's with entertainment. <sighs> because entertainment is another area that's often just an extravagance. So... Do you know how much you spend on entertainment each week? And do you know what you call entertainment? Is it actually, are there other things that you don't group in with entertainment that sort of fall under that banner? Um, Netflix or Stan, going to movies, exhibitions, concerts, weekend getaways, club memberships. All these things cost a lot of money. And they sort of fall under the entertainment banner in your budget. So what entertainment do you pay for? Can you find cheaper options? Do you really enjoy whatever it is? That probably should have been my first question because if you're only going to the concert because everyone else is, well, that's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of your energy. When we first started living the cheapskates way, we had no money. We had no money. We made the conscious decision to ditch the things that really weren't important to us so we'd have cash to enjoy the things that are. And we've never, never, never regretted that decision. And I learned to say no. Just no. So we go, oh, do you want to come? No. or no thank you don't give a reason just say no we've talked about this before too if you give them a reason they'll come up with a, a an answer to that reason so just say no so again i did some research and a trip to the movies here for two adults in a standard seat costs around 36 dollars. that's just for the movie that's not for the ice cream the chop top the drink and the popcorn Going to the movies once a week costs $1,900 a year. Entertainment costs. It costs a lot. So think about what you can do that costs nothing or, or less than what you're spending now. Again, I'm not saying don't go to the movies or don't go to the concert or to the exhibition or whatever. Don't give up your clubs. Just be choosy about them. And how often um, you use them or pay for them so you can keep more of your money. A few simple, painless changes to the way we live. And there's already potentially only $10,000, $9,900 that you're keeping. And without any really obvious, painful changes to the way you live. I'm making one simple change by letting my hair go natural and keeping $200 in my purse. So what would an extra $8,000, $9,000, $10,000 mean to your budget? Would it mean you won't need to stress so much about the power bill? Um, will it mean that you can buy fresh fruit for the kids' lunch boxes and not worry about how much it's going to cost? Would it mean that, you know, when the insurance premium arrives, you can pay it without going, oh, panicking? Will it mean that you can be able to keep paying the mortgage? Or perhaps your emergency fund will be finally fully funded with the credit card paid off. The examples, the examples I've used are just that. 
they're examples of what you could do to live more frugally. There are a gazillion ways to do this if you really choose to because living more frugally is a choice. You can choose to look at the way you live and the way you spend your money and make some small changes and in doing so keep more of your money so that you can um, maintain your lifestyle at the very least. That's being intentional about your spending and saving or you can choose to not make any changes and struggle and get deeper in debt, live with the constant stress and worry about how hard life is. If you're struggling to think of a way you can be more frugal, how about deliberately having a no spend day every week? That's just one day where you don't go grocery shopping or you don't buy a coffee or um, you don't fill the car up with petrol, you don't give the kids money for tax shop. You don't get your nails done, you don't buy plants for the garden. It's just one day where you don't spend a cent. And if on that day you find that you want to buy something, treat it with the $100 24-hour rule. Even if it's not going to cost $100, it might only be $5. Wait the 24 hours. Again, I'm not saying don't spend the money. Just wait until your no spend day is over. Because you know, by then, most likely, the urge to spend that money has gone. You've found something else or decided you don't really want it. The choice to consciously be more frugal is yours. Whatever you choose, you have to live with it. Just do something.